Hello everyone and welcome back to Color Theory for Markers. Today is episode 11 and we are finally getting to the most popular color of all red. But don't worry, this is episode 11. If you've missed some of the episodes before this, that's not a problem. Episodes 1 through 10 have taken us through yellow, green, pink, um, violet, and blue. But you can skip around. Now, I did order them from easy yellow all the way up to the most complicated, which is red. But... It's not a problem. If this is your first one that you're sitting in on, stay with us because I think you'll enjoy the presentation. All right. So as I said, this is color theory for markers because color theory is universal. It works for paint and pastels. It works for fashion and advertising. Um, it's just any place that we use color, it works. The problem is, is that the markers don't always work for us. And it has to do with the fact that most color theory lessons are structured as if you were using paint. And when you use paint, you've got a little palette there and you can mix the colors right on the palette to create something new. But with markers, you could take something like a yellow marker and a blue marker. And while you could do this and mix green paint with yellow paint and blue paint, you can't do that with markers. They don't fully mix. We layer markers. So color theory for markers is a little bit different. There's a slightly different approach to it. And that's what I'm trying to present in this series. Now, I teach intermediate to advanced classes over on VanillaArts.com. There's a link down in the description for both my workshops, but also for the resource page for today. So we are swatching red markers. This is not a blending lesson. This is a swatching lesson because what I find with my students is that a lot of people, they know how to color just fine. What they don't know how to do is how to pick out their markers for individual projects, which leaves you stuck using somebody else's blending combination. So like you wanna color a red rose and then you're typing into Google, what's the best blending combination for a rose? when really you should be looking at your own collection and saying, what reds do I have? What reds can I make? And how does how can I shade that? Color theory for markers will help you do that. So the goal here is not to color the best red rose, it's to color an independent rose that suits your style, your interest, and your taste. So as I mentioned, next in the next episode, we will be coloring a red rose. This is the rose that um, is in the class pack. So what's the class pack? Well, I have it over link in the description.com. It's over there on my main website. And in the shop, you'll find something marked Color Theory Summer 2023, and that covers blue, violet, and today's red. Then there's also a spring packet, which color covers yellow, green, and pink. So those are all the episodes all together. All right, so what's in the packet? Well, there's that digital stamp. So that rosebud that I showed you, that's a digital stamp that's over in the kit. So it has three digital stamps. It is the Forget-Me-Nots for June, the um, Iris for July, and then this month's Rosebud. So three months that it covers three digital stamps, and we'll be coloring those up in like a 30-minute exercise. You can follow along with that in the next episode. What else is in the kit? Well, today we are using the worksheets. So the worksheets, I actually have... There we go, there's a big photo reference that we'll be working from. And that's available for download at pixabay.com. Again, link down in the description takes you to the resource page with links for all of this stuff. But I know that a lot of people like to have that photo reference on a piece of paper in front of them. So the worksheet allows you to print that up and then I've also given you the colors that we will be shopping for in our kit, our collection, the colors that we're trying to find and the colors that we're trying to make. And then also in the kit is a color wheel and you'll see me using that color wheel just a little bit later. So that's everything that is in that kit that you can find. Once again, link in the description. How many times can I say that? <laughs> All right, so that photo reference. This is what we are working with. Copic makes lots of juicy red colors and we are going to color up that digital stamp using this photo as the photo reference, but when I was looking at, at that, I was like, hmm, do I really want to give a first timer 
something that has this many petals to it because it's rather complicated. So I simplified it by giving us a rosebud shape. And this is actually the photo that I used to draw from. So my digital stamp kind of looks like that image right there, but the colors are 100% coming from this image. So this is what we're going to use primarily today to pick out our colors but we'll be using these colors on the rose stamp. And that is something that we do all the time in the art world. You might be working from four, five, six different references. Some of them are inspiration that you found from the internet or someplace. And then other ones are ones that you've taken with your own camera. Quite frequently, I will draw something that I found like a really good internet photo. So I'll draw the shape of that, but then I'll use the colors that I found on a garden tour or something. So I'll combine those photos. So it's not uncommon to have one image that for the shade and shadow and then another for the color. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. Now this in itself, that's a lot of stuff to look at. So I've found that for these live streams, it's much easier if I just isolate a little section of that photo. And then as we're doing those desk shots, then I can take the color that I'm swatching and I can kind of take it over there and compare it to the photo reference. So you'll hear me refer to the, the color sample or the color bar. And that's kind of what I'm doing is I'm working in comparison to that little slice of the main photo reference. So before we start to color, you need to know, okay, what are we coloring on? And I cover this in all the episodes, so forgive me if you've heard this before, but it's super important. Today I am coloring, our, all of my swatches today are on Strathmore 300. That's a Bristol with a smooth finish. And you can see right there, at, I buy it in the 14 by 17 size. And then when I cut it down, I immediately flip it over. That way I know which is the front and which is the back. I flip it over and I put an indication at the bottom right hand corner of what that paper is. So STR Strathmore 300. If you're a beginner though, I think you'll have much better results working on Express It blending card. I cannot recommend this highly enough. I use it in all of my beginner classes and many of my intermediate classes. As my advanced classes move into more and more pencil, colored pencil on top of the Copic, then we move to a paper that's more friendly for colored pencil. Um, but in the beginning, we are working on the best paper for blending, and that would be the Express It blending card. It's silky smooth. It doesn't absorb too much ink from your markers, so it's efficient. And then it's what I call a self-blending paper, meaning that if you get enough ink down there on the paper, it's going to self-blend for you. So if you're an advanced student, somebody who's been with me for a while, try the Strathmore 300 Bristol or the 400 is good, but you want that smooth finish. And then if you're a beginner, try the Express It blending card. I guarantee Express It costs a little bit more, but it's worth it because you will start over fewer times and you'll use less ink in the long run. So you pay a little bit more for better paper in the beginning and that helps you learn good technique. And then um, eventually you can work on any paper you want once you totally know what you're doing. So that's the paper that we're working on. So why do I tell you what paper I'm working on? Because we're just swatching. Well, there's a number one rule that I have, which is always swatch on the same paper as the project. So here is my Strathmore Bristol 300 pieces that I have saved uh, off of other projects. And then here is the project printed out that we will be coloring in the next episode. And this is all on Strathmore 300. Now I know a lot of people are buying these um, 320 sets of alcohol markers or even the 50 set. And what they do is they come with like a swatch card. So you're supposed to like color in all the rectangles. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And that's a very fun thing for these people to do. You got brand new markers, let's swatch all the colors. Well, the problem is, is that, well, let me just pull out a marker. R29, here it is. R29 will look one way on Strathmore and it'll look slightly lighter on Express It. Same marker looks different on two different kinds of paper. So they don't tell you what that swatch card is, or maybe you're at home printing your own swatch card um, and you're printing it off just on Staples 110 pound cardstock. 
well, that's telling you what color R29 is on Staples 110 pound cardstock. It's going to look different on the Strathmore 300. So when you're getting ready to work a project, we swatch fresh for um, the paper that you're about to use so that you're getting the most accurate information about what colors they are, what color the marker is on that paper, and then also how it blends because it these markers blend differently on Strathmore than they do on Express It, than they do on Staples 110 pound cardstock. So you really need to use the expensive paper for your swatch cards. That's why I swatch for every project. And this is the other cardinal rule. I know it's so much fun to just have that ring full of colors or that booklet, the binder, the three ring binder with all your colored swatches in there. But what that does, and let me just demonstrate right here. Um, what those swatch cards look like, so there's R29, and then the next marker in the series, here's R30, and then R32. And this is typical of what a swatch card will do, and then it gives you the numbers right next to it. Well, that tells you what R29, R30, and R32 look like when they're surrounded by white and they're right next to other colors in the same family. But our rose here, remember that rose that we're working with? That rose isn't on a white background. That rose is on a green background. R29 is gonna look different on green than it does on white. It's the color palette that is the most important part of the project. What red you use is ultimately not as important as what that red looks like next to all your other reds and your green background and everything else that's around it. So for a project, I might look at my swatch card and say, oh yeah, I really like the color of R29. But let's say that, let's say I'm doing a Halloween project and I want it to have a spooky feel. Well, I need to see what that red looks like next to the midnight blue of the sky and the orange of the pumpkin and the green of the lights in the background or something. You need to see what those colors look like in comparison with the rest of the palette. This tells me almost nothing. So that's why you will see time and time again for every project that I do, no matter what it is, I'm swatching all over again. Now, it's fine to have those swatch cards. You don't have to burn them over an open fire if you have them. But you just have to know that they're not accurate for every paper that you can work on. So in order to have the most accurate swatch collection possible, you would have to swatch all your markers on every single brand of paper you own. And when you bring in a new brand of paper, you got to swatch all 358 markers again. And then the other thing is, is that Copic ink is not light fast. So your inks are fading, which means that really, really once every year, you would have to swatch all your markers on all your papers all over again, because swatches decompose over time. And I know a lot of students, when they hear me say that, they're, the, they're like, oh, but Amy, I don't leave my, 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 my swatches are not out on my desk. They're in a nice little binder and I keep that binder in a dark drawer doesn't matter because Copic ink is fugitive, which means it also reacts to the oxygen in the air. Now the Mona Lisa hanging on the wall in the Louvre is actually hanging in like an acrylic box kind of thing where I think they pump xenon or argon gas in there so that there's no oxygen. That's what you would need to keep your Copic swatches safe and not have to do them every six months because it's not just the light, it's also the oxygen that's in the atmosphere. It's just one of the things that you have to know when you get into Copic markers is that they're not meant to last 100 years. They're not meant to last three years. Inks fade at different rates, but they all fade because they are all fugitive. So it's just, you could be a professional swatcher or you could actually get some coloring done. Let's just go ahead and do the coloring swatch correctly for the project and you'll be a much happier person in the long run. All right, so before we start to swatch, let's just go through some general red information because that's what we're here today to explore the reds. And the first tip that I wanna give you and the reason why we're ending with red and we're doing red right after we did violet last month is because exactly the same problem that we had with the V Copics we've got with the reds. 
So last month, in the last two episodes, I was talking about how the V family of markers, and if you're looking, like here's my Copic collection. Let me get rid of that red swatch right there. Here's my Copic collection. So when you hear me click clicking over in the distance, that's what you're hearing me uh, clicking on. Um, so all of my bright colors are over on the right hand side. And the V markers are off to the far right, three rows down, just above my multi-liner pens and my tri-plus pens. So the V family itself is very, very small. And then when you look at those V colors, half of them are purple and half of them are violet. So it's even smaller when you're going to look for V violet Copics. Now the reds are up in the upper left hand corner of that right hand case and it looks like the red family is pretty big. It's like okay what are you talking about Amy? We've got lots of reds to choose from. Well the problem is if I just grab this marker blindly and I'm just grabbing a marker blindly here. I don't even know what color it is. If I were to hand you this marker what color would you say it was? Would you say that was a red marker? No he would say that that was a pink marker. If I grab this marker and I gave you that marker. Would you say that was a red marker? No, you would say that that was wine or burgundy or Merlot. Um, but you would not say that that was red. So in that red family, there's a lot of markers that are not fire engine or fire hydrant classic red. So you think you got a lot of red markers, but you don't actually have a lot of red reds. So by red red, I mean that classic kind of color. Like this is R29. It's There's a reason why everybody uses R29. And it's not because it's the best marker in the history of all markers. Everybody uses R29 because it's one of the best reds of a collection that's really, really small. So when you're looking for true reds, we don't have a lot to choose from. Um, the larger your collection, the more you have to work from. But if I'm, I have a full collection here, let me just count. So of the reds, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I count ten markers that are a true stereotypical classic red. The rest of them are either burgundy or they're pink. It's just we got 10 to choose from. So you're going to notice today that the swatching doesn't take very long because there's not a lot to choose from. So know that when you're shopping for reds, you're not the problem. Copic is the problem. They just don't give you a lot of them to work with. So oftentimes we shoot for close, not exact, when we're trying to match that photo reference. So that's the first tip. It's not you, it's Copic. They just don't make a lot of red reds. The next tip that I can give you, and this one is kind of hard to wrap your brain around. Let me get that red. There we go. This is hard to wrap your brain around, so just bear with me here. We all have a stereotype in our head of what red really is. Now, red is not as dark as you think it is, though. There's something in the human brain there's a reason why stop signs are red. Stop lights are red. Anytime we want to give somebody a warning, you write it in red letters, right? Because it stands out. Red jumps out at the human eye. We kind of are tuned into red. And there's a reason why in Schindler's List, that scene with the little girl, she's wearing a red jacket because he knew, Steven Spielberg, and I think it was Spielberg, right? He knew that the human eye gravitates towards red. And he knew that if he put that jacket in red, we would follow that around the screen exactly like he meant for us to. Red is a color that hits us psychologically. We see it, we notice it, but just because we see it and notice it doesn't mean that it's a dark color. And Copic doesn't do us any favors here because the Copic numbering system is supposed to tell us which markers are dark. And you'd find that out by looking at that last number on the marker. So this is R29, R29. It ends in a nine and Copic tells us anytime that something ends in a nine, that's a dark marker. So I can just go through here and pick up R29 and then R39 and then R59. And then our, what is the last one? Our 89. These are all the nines that they make. And we say, those are nines. They're super dark colors. But they're not as dark as that you think they are. I have a series 
where I test a series of articles where I test Copic markers. I test them for how light fast they are. I test them for how accurate the cap color is. I test them for whether they shatter when you hit them with colorless blender. And one of the other things that I test them for though is their value. This should be a value level nine and it's not. Time and time again, all four of these markers end in a nine and the value says no, they should really end in a seven or an eight. They're not as dark as you think they are. But if somebody asked you to grab a dark red, you would grab this, not realizing that this marker is not as dark as you think it is. So it leads you down a distracting path when you're working with R29, because let's say this is the first marker that you bought, and you're like, I need to shade R29. So I'm gonna shade R29 with R89. And then you start looking at that and you're like, well, okay, but that's not as dark as I need it to be. So then we see, like you see this at Christmas time when you look up um, how to color Santa with Copic markers, you see all these pictures where Santa is colored with these wacky off the wall blending combinations where people are like throwing in V99 or BV29 or a dark violet. They're trying desperately to shade red because they're thinking that this is a dark color. It's actually not as dark on paper as you think it is. So just know that when you're shopping for red markers, you're always going to pick something that you assume is darker than it actually is. So like I said, it's a psychological thing, but you have to know going into it that red attracts a lot of attention, but that doesn't mean that it's a dark color. Okay, and then the last tip that's a lot easier to think about. It's not a brain bender at all. It's the fact that red ink is a stubborn, it's a stubborn bastard. There's just no way around it. These red inks, what they do is they soak into the paper really fast and then they grab a hold of the paper fibers. And this is especially true when you're working on a paper that has a high cotton content. So those paper fibers are soaking up all that red ink and then you hit that R29 with an R24 and it says, no, I don't want to blend. I don't want to give up this R29. It's just, it's the nature of the beast that red ink is a stubborn staining color. So what happens is, is that somebody puts down this combination and they're like, oh, that didn't blend. I'm gonna go over it again. Oh, that didn't blend. So you go over it again. Wait a minute, that really didn't blend. And so you sit there and you nurse it and you nurse it and you nurse it and you try and get that color to blend. It takes a lot to get ours to blend. And you're soaking through the paper and every time you re-blend, you're making that image darker than you originally intended. So you're building up a ton of ink. You're using way more ink than you have to. You just have to know going into it that the red may not be perfect. Yellow is an easy blender. Yellow will blend all the live long day. Yellow will blend with any one you ask it to. Blue is another easy blender. The grays. Grays are super easy blenders. Those inks don't get trapped in the paper fibers, but red does. And this is a good warning because you think of red being in the red marker, right? Well, why are it says YR because there's red ink in the mixture. So red is hidden in some of the other color families. There's red ink in the YR oranges. There's red ink in the RV pinks. There's red ink also hidden in the V family and in the BV family. And um, there's also, I think there's some red in several of the browns. So it's hidden where you least expect it. And anytime you come across that stubborn ink, you just have to know that maybe this isn't going to be the best blend of my life. It's just nature of the beast. You have to work with it. All right, so let's go ahead and start swatching some colors. But before we do that, I always pull out my little iPad and then we look at that rose and we take a color tour of it. Today, I wanted to do something a little bit different. So today we are going to work with my um, Illustrator program here. Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, love it to death. I use it every day for graphic arts purposes. But if you're not a graphic artist with a professional um, amount of work. This is way too expensive for the average person. So I don't recommend this for people. If you want to use an eyedropper tool, there are tons and tons of photo apps out there where you can download the rows from Pixabay and then all you need is an eyedropper tool to be able to sample the colors. But 
I am, I like, I can work illustrator blindly, you know, with my hands tied behind my back. So it's just easiest for me to sample colors here. So first of all, let me just come down here. So get my keyboard out so that I can play around with this. So taking that color tour, we got that green background. So we're never forgetting that we are looking at red competing with the color green. But as I'm looking at the photo reference, one of the first things I always do is I look for the darkest darks and the lightest lights. So darkest darks looks like usually the center of the rose, like right in there. That's a good candidate for darkest darks. Here's a good candidate down here. How about those lights? Well, this one here, right along that ridge there, that looks pretty light to me. There's that light hit right there. All right, so I have here four little circles down at the bottom. One, two, three, four. Let's start sampling some colors and that will tell us what we're shopping for. And this is what's on your worksheet as well. So I'm going to grab this box right here because this is where I usually put the local color. Now, if you are coming to me from the coloring book world or the card making world, you probably know local color as your mid-tone. Your local color doesn't have to be a mid-tone. It's just a shortcut that you guys use. I don't like the term. It's a local color is what artists have been saying for centuries. All right, so what is a local color? A local color, well, think about something red. Um, okay, the fire engine is my overused metaphor here. All right, so the fire engine at the fire engine factory, the factory where all the guys put together all the pieces to make a fire engine. In the assembly plant, there is a guy there that sprays all the parts red. Now, when you're looking at a completed fire engine sitting out in front of a firehouse, you're looking at a three-dimensional object, right? So you see the red is darker in the shade, and there's areas of highlight on it, just like our rose here. There's, there's different colors of red going on there. But back at the factory, that factory guy that sprayed it red, he was only using one color of paint. He's using the local color. It's the color that that fire engine was born. And you can have that fire engine under the noonday sun and it'll look like a different red than it will at 7 or 8 p.m. at night. The local color is, is, it doesn't change. Our perception of it changes, but the red is always the red that it was born with. Same thing with the rose. So we're looking for the natural red of this rose without any influence from the shady areas or the highlights. We want the local color and that's the first thing that I always look for. So here's my little dot for the local color. I'm going to pull out my eyedropper tool and I'm just kind of looking in this mid-tone here area and what I'm going to do is I'm going to shop around. So I'm clicking, you hear me clicking, I'm clicking in multiple areas and I'm looking at that dot to see how does that dot change in color. If I'm clicking on several areas and it doesn't look like it's changing, then that's the local color. Now, I'm not shopping in the shade and I'm not shopping in the highlight. I am shopping in the middle color area. So that's the first color that I always isolate. And this might be the first marker that we look for today. The next color that I want you to look for. So I'm going to deselect that local color and I'm selecting the dot that's right next to it. And then switching back to my eyedropper tool is I'm going to take that local color. So we were sampling right here. I'm going to take that local color. There it is. And I'm just going to wander my eyedropper tool towards the shade. See this lightly shaded area right here? That's my shaded local color. That's my second target point. That Those are the two most important colors when I color this rose. All right. So let's find our darkest dark right here, and then our lightest lights. Now, I think it's easier to find your darkest darks because those always jump out at me. So selecting the circle for my darkest dark, I'm gonna hit the eyedropper tool, and remember we talked about right down in here. So we're getting that deep, dark color. Here's this. I'm looking for that like blackish, nasty red that nobody wants to buy that color. Whoa, there we go. That's a weird color, yeah. Let's check up here. Just looking for your darkest darks because that sets the we're not going black in this image remember I don't want you to pull out that v99 and introduce 
blackened color to your image. We're just looking for what the darkest dark is naturally in this photo. All right, so we got the darkest darks. Now let's switch over here to this top one and find our lightest lights. Switching to my eyedropper tool and I can, there's these areas that are, this is called carmine. If you're shopping for paint, this kind of light medium red is called carmine. And you notice that if this is carmine and then here's the highlight, the lightest light, it's not much lighter than carmine. I can't, I can click around here, but I'm not gonna find anything that is truly white. Mm -mm. It's more of this carmine, light carmine color. So there we go. That's our lightest light, I think. And those are the four colors that I'm going to be shopping for. So right here, I've got this one here. This is my local color. It's the fire engine paint color. It's the color that this rose was born is the local color. And then you have the slightly shady local color. And then we have our darkest dark and we have our lightest lights. And those are the colors that I'm going to be looking for over here in my Copic collection. All right, so let me switch back to the camera here. Finn's taking a nap because he's really not interested in Copics. All right, so let's go over here. I'm gonna get rid of my keyboard. I'm gonna pop my face up in the corner, put this to the side, grab some of my Strathmore paper here. I'm looking at my markers over here and I gotta tell you, gotta warn you ahead of time that I am a red nut. I love red, it's my favorite color. You notice my office chair right here is red. I've got red accents all around my house, so I color with red a lot. And I'm kind of coming into this today, kind of maybe sort of knowing where I'm gonna go because remember, there's not a lot of reds to choose from and I work with red a lot. So experience is playing a part here and I'm just gonna make an executive decision because I know that this is pointless to even try them, is our 80s. So the R80 family, here's 85, which looks pink. Here's 89, which really looks pink. Um, that whole family, they're kind of the dusky, murky um, mauve, I think is what we used to call them in the 80s. Um, yeah, it's the, 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 we're not finding that color in our rose. Remember, here's our, here's our stripe there. We're not going to find that color. So I'm just not even testing them today. Those markers really look like they belong in the RB family not in the R's. So that's my executive decision. I'm just not wasting time on anything that's marked R8 anything. All right, so let's go all the way back down to the beginning and I'm only pulling out the red reds because I know I don't need any of those pinkish reds. All right, so here's R08 and here is R05. Now, normally when you're looking at your whole Copic collection, anything that has that first number as a zero is gonna be a clean, bright, almost, I call them obnoxious colors. I'm sorry if that offends people that love these colors. They, If I was coloring a circus, that's the color I would use. They're just super bright colors. Um, so I don't use them very often. But what's interesting about the R zeros is that these colors, if I just handed you this swatch, you would think I just used two RV mark or YR markers because they look very, very orange. Now remember that my color is slightly off on my camera there. So what you're seeing right there looks a little bit more red than what I'm seeing here in person, which looks more orange. So this one was R pen, please work, R05. And this one is R08. And those to me are just way too orange. Now they're looking closer to that photo reference than I think they really do in real life. Um, you're gonna have to just swatch these in person and say, nope, that's not it. All right, so we're not doing the R zeros. Next family. The next family is the R1. So they've got, they start with a number one. And I'm pulling out R14 and R17 because those look the most traditional of the reds. All right, so here's this R14. Wow, that almost matches the R05. Those two could be twins. And here is R17. They're very, very similar. And they're a little redder as they dry. This is still looking very orange. 
And these are looking more carmine kind of colored, but they've, they've got a strong warmth to them that is inappropriate for a rose. All right, so now we come to classic red that everybody uses, R29 and R27. And honestly, I think this is where we're going today. Um, but if I find something else that works, I may challenge myself because I get tired of working with these guys. They just work really well, but I'll use them for a lot of stuff. <sighs> R27, R29, they're close in color. Um, I do recommend that you have both of them because the R27 helps the R29 blend a little better. Um, it just gives this guy a little bit more solvent to work with. So I usually use them in combination with each other. I'll put them here because I think that's probably where we're going to go. I mean, look at that. That, especially right up there, that's the color. That's it. Let's see what else we can find, though, if there's something else that'll work. All right, so the R30s are next. So R3 something, and that would be R35 and R37. All right, so 37 is the darker, and I've been putting the darker over on the left-hand side. So there's 37. And here is 35. One of these is actually called Carmine. Which one is it? Okay, so the R35 is called Coral, and then the R37 is called Carmine. All right, so... I'm going to move my microphone slightly so I can pull my paper up here to compare. I don't really, I'm not seeing the 37. Maybe it's right in there, but that 29 is better than the 37. Okay. Uh, 35, whoa, right there. Right there. Look at that. So 35 and 29, not 37. All right, so I'm putting the 37 away and... I'm keeping the 35 out because that, that looks like my local color. All right. Um, the next family is R40s. And I always feel bad about R46 because it's a lovely red color. But there's only two markers in the R40 family, R43 and R46. And this is so darned pink that even this red marker doesn't always really blend well with it. So I feel like this poor little 46 is all by itself. It's a gorgeous color and nobody wants to play with it. I'm putting that 43 away because there's no point in even testing it. Um, but let's swatch this. Poor little guy. R46. Oh. I like that. I don't want to use this. I do. I do. I want to give this one a purpose. All right, which is better? The 29, and I'm looking mostly right up in there. The 29 nails it, but that 46 is close. All right, let's keep shopping. I'm keeping that 46 out. I put the 43 away. Nope, nope, nope. Um, our 50s are exactly like the our um, 80s. They're mauve colored. Here's that 56 just to prove it to you. Look at that. It's a dirty lipstick color. So that's a big no. The 14 and the 17 are a no. So yeah, 29, 27. The 37 was a no. I like the 35. I'm definitely using this color. Which probably means that I don't need the 27. So I can put that one away. So now it's between the R29 and the R46. And because I use this one so much, I think I'm going to go with the 46. Let's see how those two look together. All right, so what am I looking for? I got reds all over the place. R46 and R35. This is what I have. And I'm dropping markers. All right, so here's the 46. And here's the 35. And I'm not really trying to blend perfectly here. I'm just trying to see, do these colors have a relationship with each other? 
I like them together. 46 and this is 35. Well, let me flip this upside down and let's look at that up there at the top there. I like that, but you know what? Right here, it works up here. That works for me. But down here, you know what it is? It's that golden color that we're seeing in the photo reference where the sun is hitting it. Ooh, okay, um, all right. What if I add a third color to this blending combination that is one of these orangey colors that we already worked with? So this is 35, sorry. I got a ends in a six, ends in a five. So what ends in a four? I could do the five or the R14. Let's try the R14. Where'd you go, R14? Just adding some warmth to this comment. Oh, I like that. I, I think this is it. Sometimes you just know it when you see it. There we go. That's what I want. It's not exact. But it, that, look, that 14 just feels right, right in this area. Especially the 14 over the 35. And then you kind of have the coolness up there. But, ooh, okay, I like that. This is my blend. This is what we're doing. All right, so there we go. R46, R35, R14. All righty. That's our red blending combination. So we've got the local color is R35. The, the dark local is the um, 46. So remember in our, um, when I was working in Illustrator, we got that dark color, but, or the local color is R35. This one right here. This one is R35. And then this one is the R46. And well, I don't have this. This is probably gonna come with pencil. Let's work on finding this color now. Okay, so that darker color, in, and this is where people are going to try grabbing that RV99 or the V99. Um, instead of trying to pick out those colors, how about if we let the color theory, the color wheel, do the work for us? All right, so week by week, every episode, we have been working with a complementary color shading system. So we underpaint with a complementary color. The complementary color is the one that is directly across from our color on the color wheel. So the opposite, the complement of yellow is violet. It's over here. And I've just given you that little handy dot so that you don't have to do this all the time trying to figure it out. All right, so we shade violet or we shade yellow with violet and we shade that yellow green with the RV purpley kind of color and we shaded green with magenta. This is what we've been doing week after week after week. And now's our time to get this red red and all the way across the color wheel is, well, it says BG13 and I put the numbers there so you had an idea if you were coloring your own color wheel. Doesn't have to be BG13 though. It can be anything that's relatively in that blue green family, but it doesn't have to be the exact opposite complement. This is a direct complement, which means it's exactly across the wheel, but you can do an indirect complement, which means a couple of colors over. You can go a couple of spaces over. You can go a couple of spaces over there. So really today you could be shopping for anything on this general part of the wheel. Anything all the way from a purpley blue, which is the B66, that's kind of a periwinkle color. It's not really blue and it's not really purple. Or you can be shopping all the way over to the yellow greens. All of these colors will work. It's just a matter of which ones you have in your Copic collection and what color they make when they interact with our colors. So um, you, we can shop for any of these and it doesn't have to be BG13, but let's try it just because it's sitting there. It's an obvious solution. All right, so BG13. We're putting that down first. And then I'm going to be testing all of these with the R46. So all of these underpaints, trying to mix these weird colors, all of the complements, I'm going to be using that R46 marker. And I'm just taking that red and going over the top. I'm not going over all the way so that you can still see that color and what I used. So this is BG13. And we're looking at the color that they make right there in the intersection. 
So let's take that and move that over here and see how that color kind of works in this shady shade area. It's not as dark as what's in the photo reference, but it's getting us closer. So you could choose something like, let's just go one step darker. BG15. This is probably gonna get us closer to the target zone. But remember, I'm also going to add some colored pencils so I can, I can get us kind of close and then add a little bit of pencil to get us all the way there, which is usually easier. So 13 and 15, and then here is that. All right, um, hmm. it's, see, it's, it's closer. It's getting in the right family. It definitely feels like, you know, that kind of color that's right in there. Like right there, that feels like that color that's right there. But I know this is gonna be a beast to blend. So this is, you know, you think it's darker than it is and we don't need to do overkill. I was warning you about it, so don't do overkill, Amy. All right, so just to prove that to you that we can use other colors, let's just pull out G14. Just for the heck of it, I don't think this is going to be what I wanna use, but this should work. Yep, see it's given us a nice, that's actually kind of a nice color right there. G, what is that, G14. It could work. If that's what's in your collection, you can use that. Not bad. I'm not in love with it though. Um, Sometimes, you know, I just test until I find what I want. Oh, okay, let me talk to you about the value colors. So if you're brand new and you don't have very many markers, I suggest getting your hands on these two colors, B34 and B24. And I teach with these for my beginners because these two colors work under red beautifully. So let's do, we'll just test them both at the same time. So here's that B34 and here is the B32. And we'll just go right over the top and right over the top. And this was B34. And we're looking at this zone right here. This is B32. And we're looking at this zone right here. And that works. Totally reliable. That's a little bit light, but that kind of feels like that's what's going on right there. So these work. If you have these in your collection, you can use them. I'm going to keep shopping for something unusual that I don't use very often. Because that's the theme of the show today, I think, is just challenging me to find a red that I have never used before. All right, so a red that I've never used before, underpaint that I've never used before. Uh, you know what? Okay, let's try them. I don't use these colors at all. B BG34, BG32. I know based on their last numbers, they're gonna work. They're pretty, why don't I use them more often? I don't think a lot of people have these colors. That's kind of nice. And I will scan this right after the live stream is over so that you can see it over there on the resource page. Where they bing, bing, bing right there. That's that color that I'm seeing right in there. Hmm. This would definitely be a challenge because I don't know how these work together. They're going to work. Hmm. All right, let's do the color that I thought coming into today that I was going to end up using. Uh, Miss Experience, this is what I thought I was going to use. BG05 and BG02.
Actually, that looks pretty blue. <laughs> I like these guys better. <laughs> these will work. I ran a class with these before. So many of these color combinations would work. It's really up to your taste. I think I'm going to challenge myself by doing the BG34 and the BG32. Now, if you don't have those markers, you can use the 34, the B34 and the B32. You could use the BGs. Test it. See what you like. Um, but this is something that I've never done before, so I'm kind of interested in going in that direction. So my final combination here, Amy's combination that she's going to be working with is... BG34, BG32, that gives us a nice little transition um, so we can go super shade and just a little bit of pushing. Wow, that's pretty. There's the R46, which doesn't get enough use. That's really the theme here today is markers that we don't use very often. That was the 35, because I love that color. And then here's that 14, adding some sunshine. BG34. B, G, 3, 2, R, 46, R, 35, and then R, what is that? R, in my hand, 14. This is our combination that I will be coloring the um, rosebud with. There we go. All right, so we need in that image, there's green and um, in the digital stamp, there's a stem and some sepals, the little leaf things that protect the rosebud. Um, so we need a green for that. And let's just use the greens that we used in the iris. And that was, uh, what was that? I think it was G94 and G24. I wanna use markers. I hate the idea of you having to run out and buy new markers for everything. So here's that 24 and here's the G94, but honestly, a lot of greens will work here. So G94, G24, that looks good. All right, let's talk about colored pencil. Now, when we do the colored pencil, here's my, there. Uh, this is my sleeve with all my Prismacolors in it. Um, I want a pushing color. So, I don't usually do like red on red, but this is a slightly lighter red, so I want to find a dark red. I'm going to pull out, what is this? I've got two colors here. Running out of room. All right, I got two colors here. What is this one? They would both work. What is this? This one is raspberry. This is 1030. And this one is crimson lake. Oh, everybody will have the crimson lake because I think this is, the crimson lake comes in like the um, 24 and the 50 something. Um, it's a pretty, it's an early, it's got that low number to it. So that means it's an, it's one of their oldest colors. Um, not everybody will have the raspberry, but the raspberry would work. So either one of those two. Um, and that is because in that original, the reason why I want this red, to be perfectly honest, is in this original um, rosebud, there's some veins along the side that I'm seeing. And they're really subtle, but I want this red to be able to draw those veins. So that's what I'm doing there. But for a true pushing color, I'm going to introduce you to my friend... Um, Prismacolor Dark Purple. This is, um, I call it a magic color because it is transparent. It's purple, but it lets the Copic shine through. This is Prismacolor number 931, and it is in, I think, every single box. It's a wonderful color. The problem is, is that this color goes flaky on us sometimes. It's not super light fast. I think it's the least light fast of all the Prismacolors, but also when Prismacolor Dark Purple hits other pencils, it can sometimes go hot pink on us. So what I found is um, my substitution for it, and I actually keep it here in my Prismacolor set, is a Derwent Light Fast Purple. Now Derwent Light Fast doesn't have numbers, so you just have to look for the one that says purple, and you can buy this open stock and just buy it um, by itself, which is what I do because I don't use a lot of the other light fast colors. Um, 
but I use this purple in place of the 931. So you can use either one, um, but this is my super push. So in that, like in the crevices where the color is super deep and it's gonna be deeper than this BG32 or 34 can get us, this is what I'm using. So this is Derwent, Lightfast, DL, and Purple. And I do this in a lot of my classes. Um, but here, just for comparison, is the dark, the Prismacolor 931. You could use it. It's just, it it's not safe to use in every project all the time. I wish it was, because I dearly love the color, but it's not. All right, so I've got the pushing color. I've got those greens. Um, what pencil did I use last month? This one is sitting on top. It's kelp or it's either marine green or kelp. I, I should have looked it up. Let's just use this kelp. I think it's the one that I used. Kelp is number 1090. So I've got that green for working with the stem as well as this Derwent Light Fast Dark Purple. Um, so this is all to do the veins and then super pushes and then these I can work with on the greens. I need a pulling color for that highlight area. And remember we saw how pink it was, so should I get a pink pencil? Um, The problem is Prismacolor doesn't make nice pinks. The light pinks are all a little weird. This deco pink, it would work. It's probably the right color, but you know, I think I can also get the same effect, and this is gonna sound weird until you see it in practice. I think I can get the same effect with cream. So here is that deco pink. If you have it, you can try it. It's number 1014, 1014. But I, honestly, instinct tells me that I'm gonna end up using the cream, because I use this color a lot for this effect. Um, so let me just show you in a second here. This is 914. I'm writing in pen because this pencil is so light. What happens with the cream is you can take it and use it really lightly over the top of these reds. And because it lets some of that Copic shine through, you wouldn't know that I was using a yellow pencil or a yellowish pencil. Um, it just, it looks, it's like a chameleon. So this kind of looks like pink in a way that the deco pink has more white to it, so it's blocking more of the color below. They both work, but I kind of like the sunshine that the cream provides. It doesn't surprise me because I use this on flowers all the time. And speaking of sunshine, don't let us forget that parts of that rose have that kind of sun shining on it. Um, so we need a transparent yellow. And that is one thing that, like, okay, let me pull out the yellows that Copic makes. So there's three yellows, there might be four, but that's what I got in my kit. And everybody's always wondering, why, are, why do we have three pencils that are virtually the same color? Well, this one here, lemon yellow, is a little bit greenish. So that's the reason for that. I guess this, because this was like, this is one of their oldest colors. This is, was in the original box that was ever invented. Um, and I think people complained about it being too greenish because it does look green in some situations. So then we got two other yellows here. One is deco yellow and one is canary. And the difference between the two is that this guy has a lot of white in it. Deco yellow has a lot of white in it. So it is an opaque pencil. And then canary over here is a transparent pencil. So they're basically the same color. It's just the white content is different. Um, it's the same shade of yellow, it's just this one is transparent and this one is opaque. And we want the transparent one because I want to be able to go over, here's that R46, I want to be able to go over these areas and add just a little bit of sunshine, some, give it a suntan, just a little bit of a kiss there. And it lets the red shine through, but you're still getting that golden color. So this right here, and because it's yellow, is canary yellow and it is number 916. There we go. I think that's what I will be using. So my marker combination, let's pull this out one more time. My marker combination, well first of all those greens, 
are G94 and G24. And then my blend, my red blend is BG34 and BG32 for the underpaint. And then over the top of that is R46, R35, and R14. Um, do I have all my bases covered? I've got the stem, I've got the supples, I've got the petals, I've got pencils for pushing, I've got pencils for sunshine. What else do I have? I've got a background to color. I'm gonna throw in one more marker. All right, so this is BG11, BG11. And I'm gonna throw this one in as a background color. I don't know what background technique I'm gonna do, so I might end up mixing the BG11 with one of these other BG markers, with the 3-4 or the 3-2. Um, but BG11 is great for backgrounds. If you don't already own it, you really should because it's an excellent background color. I love it, love it, and I haven't used it in a while, so and it works really well with as those three as a combination. So there we go. I've got those three BG colors. I've got the three reds, and then I've got the two greens that we used last month just for the supples and the stem. Um, but you can use whatever green combination you want. I am going to scan this and upload it to the resource page so that you can see all these samples in real time. Um, and I will meet you back here in episode 12 for when we color the rosebud. All right, there we go. Lots of stuff to do here. I'm kind of excited about this. I'll see you later. Happy coloring.